Our featured lecturer tonight is Ed Trout, an assistant publisher of the Jonesboro, Arkansas Sun. The Sun was recognized as one of three finalists for the 1999 Pulitzer Prize in the Breaking News category for its reporting of the March 24, 1998 school rampage in Jonesboro that killed four students and one teacher. Mr. Trout, a fourth generation newspaper man, has printer's ink in his veins. His great-grandfather, W.O. Trout, purchased The Sun in 1901, and his father, John Trout, is now editor and publisher. The Sun, which has a daily circulation of 28,789 and a Sunday circulation of 32,437, is the fourth largest newspaper in Arkansas and the largest independent daily. Trout attended the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville and Arkansas State University in his hometown where he graduated in 1985 with a Bachelor of Science degree in journalism. He has served as a reporter, page designer, photographer, and numerous other positions on the newspaper. Please join me in a warm South Texas welcome for Mr. Ed Trout. that I was not here tonight. Uh, quite frankly, I'm here tonight because of children killing children. And uh, it's uh, not my favorite topic to talk about. I had a great speech <clears throat> that I had prepared tonight. So it's been a while, everybody. And I thought, you know, I'm, t I'm talking to a class full of journalists and future journalists and uh, I don't want to do the same thing I've done over and over and over. What I'd like to do tonight, and I know I've got to put this mic up over here on me before I get started, what I'd like to do is, first of all, give a brief description of, of Jonesboro to, so you, that you'll better understand maybe what happened there and how we reported it. Go through some of our pictures that, uh, that we ran and uh, really get into more of a question and, and answer uh, type of program. Um, if anything uh, that I can leave you with tonight, I would like to leave you with uh, how we covered a story, uh, not just based on kids who killed kids, but how we tried to cover the community as a whole because the whole community was a victim in this tragic shooting. And um, that was our main focus as we covered it then, as we continue to cover it, because it just does not seem to go away. So with that, uh, let me hook up this mic. And I'll start going through this. How much leeway do I have here? I think it's fine. First of all, let me give you just a little bit of a uh, description of Jonesboro, the Jonesboro Sun, uh, and my family who has operated the newspaper since 1901. Uh, as you heard earlier, my great-great-grandfather, W.O. Trout, bought the newspaper in 1901. Uh, he had spent most of his time out in the Oklahoma Territory taking pictures of Indians, uh, trying to raise up some money and uh, saved up $900 and had the opportunity to either buy a newspaper in Spiro, Oklahoma, or uh, he heard of one for sale in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Luckily for me, uh, he chose Jonesboro, Arkansas because I don't believe there's paper at all today in Spiro, Oklahoma, and <laughs> Jonesboro has grown from a town of, I believe, about 3,000 in 1901 to just over 60,000 today. So uh, I'm quite proud that he decided to leave the flatlands and, and come to the hills of Arkansas. Um, my father is currently the editor and publisher, and he is very actively involved in the newspaper, as he is in the community. He's 69 years old and works seven days a week, still works, comes in at night. Uh, at least two nights a week and, and works a double shift. Uh, he has 50 
odd years experience in the newspaper business, but more importantly, uh, he has that much experience in the community business and uh, our paper is always focused very heavily on the community. We don't pull any punches when it comes to covering news, but we have always kept the community uh, involved in, in our decisions that we make. Uh, my brother and I are also daily involved in the newspaper. We do have outside interest in real estate that uh, uh, keep us kind of going back and forth between Arkansas and Florida, but one of us is in town at all times. Uh, of the three of us, somebody's at the newspaper at all times except for the day that this happened, which I'll get to in just a little while. Um, anyway, I'm going to start off going through this slideshow and uh, then we'll get into a question and answer period. Does anybody recognize this photo? Can you remember seeing it anywhere? This is the uh, photo that Time Magazine chose to run as their cover. We had the photo first and I was working the day we got that photo and I came in and looked at it and I said I'm not about to run that. Okay. So I passed on it and sent it over to Time and they ran it. One of the reasons that I passed on it was because, first of all, in that picture that child is probably a year and a half, two years old. Um, he didn't choose to be photographed like that. That It portrayed what the national media had come into Jonesboro and tried to do and that was uh, focus in on the tobacco chewing, gun toting, redneck, uh, and that picture helped portray that. So, one of the reasons I passed on it. Whoa. The picture we just went by was Mitchell Johnson, by the way. He is one of the, the 13 year old shooter. This is the area where the uh, grassy knoll, as we call it, this is where the kids open fire from on the school. So, I'm going to pause right there and, and lead you into what happened. Um, I'm not, <clears throat> just go back a little bit. On October 1st, 1997, it happened in Pearl, Mississippi. Two months later, in West Paducah, Kentucky. On March 24th, it happened in Jonesboro. On April 24th, in Edinburgh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. On May 19th, in Fayetteville, Tennessee. On May 21st, Springfield, Oregon. And now, just last week, in uh, Littleton, Colorado. And uh, the media uh, were covering a rash of school shootings on the front pages and at the top of the newscast. Though such shootings have happened before, a cycle worth investigating nationally has emerged, prompting talk of a growing trend, the copycat effect, root causes and guns in school, not to mention media excess, sensationalism, and insensitivity. News organizations were challenged with present breaking news, uh, or to present breaking news thoroughly and accurately with empathy and depth, and for an audience that took, ex took extreme, often personal interest in all aspects of tragedies involving children and violence. What place should the articles receive? How much does the public need and want to know? And where should the focus of the coverage lie? Many of these questions require serious consideration before a traumatic event like a school shooting occurs. After all, newsrooms don't have a lot of time to establish detailed game plans once the violence takes place. And that's where we found ourselves, and that's where I think every newspaper that's had to cover any event like this, you know, it happens, you react, you don't have time to come up with a game plan. And that leads me to going through these pictures. Okay. This is our first day coverage. Kurt Hodge is our, one of our senior reporters who has been with the newspaper for 30 years um, and is a graduate of Arkansas State. Was about three or four miles away 
in an auto parts store when he heard the ambulances and somebody came in and said something's going on over at West Side School. He immediately called the 911 center and they told him what was going on and within just a few minutes he was at the scene with the first ambulances and the first pictures you see here will be his photographs. When he arrived, uh, there were still bodies laying all over the outside of the school. He uh, had the opportunity to photograph those bodies had he chose. He knew we would not run them had he photographed them, so he did not. Um, it's our policy that we do not run pictures of victims uh, laying around in, in accidents or whatever. He knew that and had the good taste not to shoot them. So these are the first pictures he, he shot as some of the victims were being brought out. This is the teacher, Shannon uh, Wright, who was killed. More of the first, Brittany Barner, one of the victims dead. This picture was when our first photographer got on the scene. Uh, this was widely used across the country and across the world, actually. That is one of the students hugging a teacher. Another victim. This picture was also widely used. This was shot by Kurt Hodges. Uh, and I believe that is uh, Brittany Barner's body that they're bringing out. He did not uh, ask who the victim was and uh, probably shouldn't have. Another victim. This is the aftermath. This is really as close to running uh, a bloody picture as we chose to run. Uh, we waited until they had removed the victims before we shot anything. This picture was also seen uh, in Time Magazine and several others, the ambulance personnel at the scene. Bullet holes. This is uh, at the hospital. More hospital photographs. I believe this is at the hospital also. That is the one of the wounded children. He was the first one released from the hospital. If I can get this thing to work. This is a candlelight vigil that was held the first night uh, of the shooting. That's a softball coach uh, of one of the victims. And here's where the frenzy starts. This is the first night briefing by uh, one of the surgeons. And you can tell the media frenzy that's already started. Um, when this happened, of course, we were on the scene first, along with the local television station, and within about an hour and a half, um, there were helicopters coming in from Memphis and Little Rock, and by that night, probably 60 news organizations were already in town. Um, during the first week, over 200 news organizations uh, were represented in Jonesboro, and that for a newspaper is one of the hardest things you can imagine. Uh, you're trying to put out a newspaper and you're also having to uh, answer questions for all the rest of the media. It's almost an impossible situation that there's no way to prepare for. And what we did in this instance was because my staff was so overwhelmed with requests from media outlets on how to, you know, wanting any information they could get it almost got to the point where they could not do their jobs. So what we did was myself and my brother took over handling all national media and all those calls came to us and it, probably 300 
calls a day between the two of us that freed my staff up to go about doing their job. And that's very, very important. If this ever happens to you, and it, it will on some scale, if you're in, in this business long enough, uh, it's important that your staff be free to go and do the job that they're trying to do and not have to interview uh, other media. And that was our first and, and biggest challenge on the, on the first day. This is us trying to get the paper put together. And this is the first day's uh, first page. You'll notice that we ran the photo and names of the two victims, or the two shooters. Um, we chose to do that as soon as we knew that, uh, and we confirmed through at least 19 different sources, although none officially on the record because they were juveniles. We were sure beyond a reasonable doubt that these were the two uh, suspects, age 11 and 13. We ran the pictures. The only other newspaper to run these pictures was the New York Times on the first day. We did put them out over the Associated Press wire and they chose to take them off the wire because they were afraid of the juvenile uh, problems with uh, running uh, juvenile names in the paper. There are no problems under Arkansas law. You, you may not report the names of juvenile victims uh, as heard in court, but if you confirm those names uh, outside of a courtroom, uh, you're, you're free to do whatever you want to, and we chose to do that. National media waited until we did, and then you heard um, uh, the national media would always quote that the Jonesboro Sun said that these were the, uh, the shooters. Uh, a little bit of protect yourself, I guess. And that we devoted about eight pages a day for, for uh, the first seven days to the shooting. This is the second day when they're going to before a judge uh, for an adjudication hearing. And the white ribbons started going up immediately. That's day two. National media again. Uh, this is the principal and superintendent of Westside. This is on day two. This is day two. This is playing of the 911 tapes. The sheriff and an investigator, we were the only uh, media representative to be able to photograph the van which the two children had stolen and filled with weapons with their ill-fated plan to, uh, after the shootings, to go to their deer camp uh, or if they didn't want to go to their deer camp, they were going to drive to Mexico. Day three. This is the first of the funerals. We were covering this from several, hun several hundred yards away. Uh, as you can imagine, the media coverage on the funerals was uh, just about unbelievable, as you can see there, and very invasive to the families. Um, this is the sheriff, and that's day four. And this is day five. On day five, we, uh, were able to contact all five of the victim's families and uh, because of our relationship in the community, we were able to interview all five of the families and what we did was we asked them to give their memories of their, uh, their children or their wife and uh, all, all five families were gracious enough to share their memories uh, with us and with our readers and that 
was one of my favorite uh, stories of all the ones we covered uh, and one of the hardest to get and one of the most miraculous that we did get and we were able to get it strictly because uh, of our relationship with the community uh, we did not pursue it we did not pressure the families we just sent a note over saying this is what we're doing if you would like to participate and instead of hounding uh, like so much of the media was doing to these people you know they called us we didn't call them and that's the way we covered this story from day one is we were not invasive uh, we can cover the news without being uh, hard on victims. It's not the policy of our newspaper uh, to be hard on victims. We're hard on, on, on the perpetrators, but not on victims. Of course, Janet Reno. We had a uh, faith and hope and healing uh, that was at Arkansas State University uh, of a town of 61,000, approximately 8,000 showed up uh, for this event, which is pretty phenomenal. Again, this is inside. Uh, I don't know that we ran any of these pictures. Uh, this is the school teacher who was shot and wounded. This was her first day out uh, of the hospital. more of the media frenzy. We're the only newspaper to be able to um, shoot pictures of the children coming for their adjudication, their adjudication hearing. Uh, again, there were several hundred media representatives in town and we were able to get these photographs because once again we went back to our roots of uh, th this is our area, we know how to cover it better than anyone and uh, you know we went back to our sources we knew where the most probable locations were that uh, they would unload them and uh, and we were there to, to snap the photographs it's the father of one of the shooters and this gentleman right here is an attorney who volunteered his services for the shooter's uh, family. First off, anytime somebody volunteers themselves, be wary uh, of what's, what the real purpose is. And that was our first thought. Further investigation proved that uh, he was a scam artist and he had been in trouble in Florida and uh, everywhere else for scamming people he's still in trouble uh, they're still coming after him he disappeared his whole intent was uh, to get national spotlight and go on all these talk shows which he did this is where the kids are being held now at the uh, state uh, department of youth services this is one of the parents uh, who has become a very big gun control advocate. More of that. This is uh, at the one year anniversary, which was last month on the 24th. That is Mitchell Wright, the f husband of uh, Shannon Wright, who was killed. And then this was last week. Uh, again, the media after Littleton descended back on Jonesboro once again as uh, Ted Koppel is doing a, a night line from Jonesboro. And these are the first two pictures of the shooters that we got out of a yearbook. 
This is kind of an interesting thing. The Japanese were very, very interested in uh, the fact that we ran the pictures and the names of uh, uh, the two shooters. Uh, in Japan, they cannot do that, and uh, doing so shames the family. So they were doing a poll uh, outside uh, the Freedom Forum's uh, presentation on covering the media and uh, you can see that uh, the American people weren't too sympathetic to the fact that we ran their names as they uh, I think they had one one person out of all of them said no that we should not have run their names this is in our newsroom once again the media uh, basically took over our operation and uh, this is the Japanese uh, film crew coming in and wanting to know more about the children. My brother doing an interview with CBS. I think that is all of them. Go back. Well, maybe I can't. one okay anyway that's going to reload and uh, now we'll get on with what I was really going to do but I wanted you all to be able to see the slideshow let me briefly go over some of the decisions that affected our coverage several key decisions that affected our coverage of the West Side tra tragedy were made uh, within hours uh, after the two children fatally shot four students and a teacher and wounded ten others. Reporter Kurt Hodges arrived at the school, uh, the first rescue units, and uh, as I said earlier, there were dead still on the sidewalks. He chose not to, to shoot those photographs. Um, within hours also, the new staff had identified the shooters. Uh, that were in custody from non-police sources. The decision was made to publish the names and pictures of the boys ages 11 and 13 because the types of rumors that were uh, spreading throughout the community, the names were known to hundreds of people connected with the school and with the community uh, needed to realize the extent of the tragedy that ordinary little boys carrying out a sophisticated massacre uh, with no outside help uh, had, had done this at Westside and we felt it was important that uh, their names not be protected. Uh, early on it was decided that the sun would be as hard hitting as possible in the coverage of the criminal aspects of the tragedy. Major efforts should be uh, to depict the stories of the victims. It was decided that the entire community would be classified as victims and that we would not spend most of our time concentrating on the shooters but on the community itself, the victims uh, were not only those who were shot, the whole community uh, felt victimized that this had happened in Jonesboro. Uh, nobody obviously anywhere would think this could happen in their community. Um, on the legal side, uh, dealing with two very young children, uh, we decided that uh, juvenile court pr proceedings should be covered. Well, juvenile court proceedings in the state of Arkansas, as in most states, uh, are not open to the press. We filed a, a motion and petitioned uh, the juvenile courts uh, to allow representatives uh, of the son uh, and a sketch artist into the hearings. He uh, made a wise decision and granted us that access, uh, allowing, uh, for the first time in Arkansas history, uh, a juvenile case to be covered by the media. Um, it was, we were allowed three spaces and sketch artist and we opened up another six uh, spaces for national media and uh, local television station. Um, let's see what else we had here. A reason for seeking opening of the hearings, obviously, uh, was to keep a traumatized community fully informed and to head off rumors uh, of gangs uh, being behind the tragedy. First of all, after this happened, it was uh, obviously r rumors were running rapid. It was gangs were doing it, uh, cults were involved, 
and uh, we thought that by opening up the ju juvenile proceedings that we could get the correct information out to our readers uh, and squash that. Our stance throughout the tragedy was to give full and complete coverage of all aspects uh, of the shooting and at the same time be as sensitive as possible to the emotions of a traumatized community. Uh, with a small news staff, it was necessary for staffers to work extremely long hours. Uh, our news staff consists of 16 reporters, uh, three photographers, uh, six full-time sports uh, writers, and a, a number of Arkansas State University students who serve as interns part-time. Uh, the coverage of the tragedy cost our newspaper literally somewhere in the neighborhood of $100,000 to $150,000 uh, in not only extra newsprint over time, but you know, when this happens to a community, uh, the first thing that happens is your advertisers say, you know, this is not good for business. So, you know, over the course of the next month, uh, our revenue decreased somewhere around $100,000, but at no time did that affect our coverage. Uh, and it, it could have, and I've seen it happen in other communities where this has happened, that uh, the news coverage declined uh, as the revenue did. Um, that's basically the slideshow. What I'd really like to do is, instead of going into this long speech, is to open this up and answer questions related to the coverage uh, and why we covered things the way we did. Um, so with that, I would prefer just to st start taking questions. No, uh, you know, obviously we've had major tragedies in Jonesboro before. We've had tornadoes that have killed 34 people. We've had bus wrecks where 11 students were killed. Uh, but any time you're in an atmosphere where hundreds of reporters come to town and are constantly uh, trying to do whatever they can do to get the story back that they, their editors have sent them you know, hundreds of miles for a reason. They want a story. Uh, they're not involved on a daily basis with the community. We are. You know, we've been there a hundred years and we're going to be there in another hundred years. Uh, it does not affect the news as far as getting the story. We can get the story. Uh, and we didn't miss a single story. Uh, the national media didn't get anything that we didn't have or chose not to run. We just went about it in a different way. Uh, instead of hounding, we rely on our sources that we've built, you know, out of years of being in the community. Um, and for us, and I think for most newspapers or most any media, relying on your sources that you've had and built uh, for a long period of time uh, is much smarter than all of a sudden because uh, the national media has come in and they're hounding and hounding and, and you get wrapped up in that real quick. It's very easy to get wrapped up in what the national media is doing and thinking that that is what, what you have to do. And, and we came close to it. On the first day you could see our reporters going out and saying, you know, but ABC is over here interviewing this person and, and CBS is over here. And we said, well, wait a minute. You know, that's, that's not what we're here to do. Let's focus on how we cover ourselves. Don't worry about what the national media does. And because of that, because we stayed focused on what we do best, uh, we were able to uh, cover this as completely, uh, I think, as it could have been covered. If you've been somewhere else, would you have done it any differently? I don't think so. Uh, I mean, I've been in this business all my life. My fa you know, I'm 37 years old, and I've been in, involved in this long enough to know that um, you've got to cover a story and you, you cannot treat victims as uh, uh, the way that, I don't, I don't really know how to, <laughs> to say it and I've said it so many times, but 
uh, we focus and I would focus any time on, on treating victims with compassion and I don't think that my readers uh, would expect or would want to read uh, our stories any other way. I just really don't. Could have. Uh, I think you could go back in my family's pictures of me and find a lot of pictures of me probably wearing a cowboy outfit. Uh, you might be able to find some of yourself wearing a cowboy outfit. Um, you know, I don't know. Um, I, I was not there to raise that child. That was day one. Uh, that picture came out, and I thought that. For a, a two-year-old child who, uh, you know, while at that time he was a shooting suspect, and obviously it, we knew that he was uh, a shooter uh, and was guilty, to go back and pull out a photo that he had nothing to do with and that we knew, we knew none of the history behind uh, and that portrayed what the national media was coming in, you know, the first thing they want to do is start blaming guns for everything and, uh, and, and start focusing on the stereotypes of the, the area that, that we were in. And that picture was a typical stereotype and you could go anywhere in the country and find that picture. But uh, I was not going to run a picture of a, a two-year-old child holding a gun and, and a camouflaged outfit uh, because of the stereotype, basically. I didn't think it was pertinent to the story. I had a couple of questions. Was that the uh, first time that you'd ever run the name of juvenile offenders? No, it, actually it wasn't. Uh, probably two months before, we'd had a, a case where a 15-year-old uh, girl had escaped from a juvenile or from a county jail in, in a county that adjoins us and uh, she was uh, being held in jail on first degree murder charges but she was being at that time uh, she had not been released from the juvenile courts and charged as an adult so she was still under the protection of the juvenile courts. Um, we found out the name uh, and we ran the name and uh, I would do it again. Uh, that was a public, uh, the public had a right to know who this person was. The person was on the loose uh, and, you know, for public uh, welfare, I don't think that the courts are, because you're underage, you should be protected uh, from being published in the newspaper or on TV or anywhere else. And uh, we did file a motion in court to, uh, to get that name and were granted. My second question is similar to hers. It seems like the national media has more and more of a responsibility, uh, especially as, as shootings become more and more common, to, to cover them instantly. Uh, well, in, what, how can they handle the responsibility better, or, or at least in a way that Well, they've gotten better. Uh, you know, the Freedom Forum came in uh, a month after uh, the Jonesboro shootings and did a very intensive study on uh, was the media fair and we had about uh, 400 people show up for a, a several hours worth of uh, dialogue and then the Freedom Forms investigation and all in all the uh, the media graded out quite well uh, it's a few bad apples, if you will, that can spoil everybody's uh, reputation. And that's what happened in Jonesboro. We had the Montel Williams show come in and uh, uh, somebody uh, portrayed themselves as a nurse to sneak into one of the victims, one of the injured victims' rooms to try and get them signed up for the Montel Williams show. Uh, we had uh, several reporters from uh, a newspaper uh, in the Northeast 
hiding behind tombstones uh, at the at one of the funerals so they could get close-up pictures. Uh, you know, a couple incidents like that out of you know hundreds and hundreds of journalists can really uh, mess everything up for everybody. Did, did y'all end up doing any stories in, that ran in your paper itself on the media's impact on your community? Absolutely. Uh, that was one of the major stories that was happening because uh, obviously uh, the community tired of the media very quickly and uh, they tired of the stereotype that was going out uh, on so many of the shows, uh, especially the talk shows. Uh, and so there were some negative reactions, some confrontations from people around Jonesboro uh, with the satellite trucks. You know, they, they would fly on the, uh, the national hello signal uh, <laughs> quite regularly. Uh, and on, on more than one interview occasion where they would be interviewing me or someone else, you know, the, the pickup trucks with the, the national hello would drive by and honk their horns. And, uh, and I understand why they got tired of the media because, uh, you know, the people were coming in to do a job, but they were under a deadline like we all are. They were all looking for something different uh, that their competition wouldn't have. And uh, instead of focusing on covering the story, they had, the, you tend to start broadening out and trying to grasp at anything a little bit different rather than staying focused on, you know, what is the story? And uh, that happens especially after the first couple of days as the story gets a little bit colder and they're grasping for anything. And at that time of the Jonesboro incident, we were in between presidential affairs and uh, of, of the first week of coverage, uh, according to the Freedom Forum, the Jonesboro incident received 68 minutes of on-time news, national news air on TV, uh, compared to about 42 minutes for the O.J. Simpson first week. Uh, so, you know, that kind of put, puts it in perspective if you think back on how much coverage was devoted to O.J. Simpson's uh, first week of, uh, uh, of his ordeal uh, and that we had 20% more coverage than that, uh, it was uh, there was a lull in the in, uh, news from national media at that time, so they were f focusing uh, intensely on Jonesboro. Yes. Um, did you get any feedback from the outside media on the release of the tombstones? Names were they like shocked, or they were like, "Have you did it first? Or yeah, uh, we we got a lot, especially from the European uh, and and the Japanese media. Uh, first of all, uh, that was a very big deal uh, for them. Uh, it was no surprise to us, and we knew when we ran the names that uh, the the networks and and a lot of the national media would. Uh, come in after we ran them and then start quoting us as being the source uh, as their legal departments tell them to do. And uh, I was pleased uh, after the Littleton uh, shootings to see that uh, uh, there wasn't that lull uh, like, like there had been in previous shootings. Uh, the papers, uh, many, many more of the papers ran names and photos. Uh, of, of the shooters. Uh, of course, a little bit different situation. They were dead, for one thing, but uh, I was pleased to see that. And that has changed uh, just in the last, since the Jonesboro incident, it has slowly changed. Of course, you know, heck, we're getting good at this. It's getting, you know, I'm sorry. Um, is there, when you keep mentioning juvenile names, I don't see a problem. Is there a legal problem with it, or is it just more? Really, uh, it, it's both, but. Uh, Legally, the only time you can't run a juvenile's name is if you uh, learn his name or her name in a uh, court proceeding. Uh, other than that, if you can verify it outside of a courtroom and you did not learn the name in a courtroom, uh, you know, you're free to run uh, any, any information you can run and not be uh, held under a contempt of court order. So, you know, we did not have a problem with it. We, we, did not learn the name in a court proceeding, and we confirmed it with at least 19 uh, sources who, while they wouldn't confirm it on the record, 
would confirm it off the record. So we were quite comfortable with the fact that we knew we had the right two children, you know, even though they were 11 and 13. Uh, not running their names was never considered. Yes? How do you think, um, I, this is kind of a basic question, I, how do you think that your coverage of this event distinguished you uh, enough for you to be a, a Pulitzer Prize? Well, first of all, we were not and have never entered a competition before in our lives. Uh, we've been begged to enter statewide competitions. We've never done it. We've always felt that our recognition came from our readers, that they respected what they did, what we do, and that they buy our newspaper. Um, so when our coverage never varied thinking we're going to try and, and win a Pulitzer Prize, we did what we do, and what we do is focus on the community. Um, we do not pull punches when it comes to covering the news. Uh, we covered it in, in the style that we cover it with compassion for the community, realizing that the community itself is a victim. And, uh, you know, you don't need an overabundance of, of gore on uh, a photograph, you know, the picture of that we had of the the student with blood on her shirt hugging her teacher uh, is graphic enough and paints enough picture to me without having a bloody body on the ground. Uh, it kind of goes back to last week, or I guess it was last week, I was making up page one and the story of the day was the bombing in, uh, of the refugees in Kosovo. Uh, that we mistakenly bombed a convoy and on the screen were probably 20 pictures of this convoy and of all 20 pictures there were body parts strewn everywhere you know a head here an arm here I thought who in the world is using this I turn around CNN's on the news and you know there's body parts rolling down the street I thought good lord I mean you know there are plenty of pictures that graphically show uh, a scene and emotionally show a scene without showing body parts. I think we all get the idea. And uh, really that's, that's how we covered the whole story is that you know, it was given fact. Uh, everybody knew the, the, the goriness of the uh, incident uh, without having to say it. I mean, it, it was obvious. Yes? Do you think uh, that the media's inclination uh, I do, and after the Jonesboro shootings, um, I said all along that you know there are 200 million guns in the United States currently today, and in 1960 there were 200 million guns in the United States. For 200 years, there have been millions of guns in the United States. Why is it that only in the last 10 years, the last 12 years, have these incidents of children killing children, school shootings, why is it just now that that, that is happening? It has to be some sort of uh, change in, the, in the, our children, what they're accustomed to, their, uh, the, what they're exposed to. and. You know, that was what I maintained after our shootings. The national media came in and wanted to focus on the gun culture and saying, well, it's because of the guns. It's, uh, uh, they've changed. After the, the Littleton shootings, now they're saying, maybe it's a desensitization uh, of, of our culture, our children, the way we're raising them, what they're exposed to. Uh, you know, my son plays Nintendo. He can kill 4,000 people in an hour sitting at one of these things and then reboot it and they're back alive and everything's normal. Um, I don't know, I don't think anybody has those answers, but I, I think that that's gotta be the right track. I think it is. Yes? What do you think that the media can do to portray the things that people wanna know, to tell people the, what's going on without doing things like desensitizing people or encouraging the copycat and that's a problem that's being faced right now as uh, schools are getting bomb threats called into them, newspapers are getting bomb threats called into them to say that, you know, so-and-so, we put a bomb in this school. 
Um, you know, it's always been our policy that we don't run that. And I think everybody's running into that problem. Uh, to get back to your question is what can be done, you know, the news is the news and we have to cover the news. Uh, you know, you hear the sheriffs after these shootings saying that, you know, one of the problems is that the, the media uh, keeps, you know, portraying and covering these events and it's causing copycats. Uh, well, we've got to do our job and we've got, you know, it's news and we've got to report it. But I think the way that we report it uh, has to be, we have to be more responsible in the way we report it. The amount of space, the amount of time that we stay on a story. Uh, one of the biggest things you can do is know when to pull a story off page one. And for us, that was uh, on the ninth day, uh, we were starting to pull stories off page one. Uh, and, you know, Right now, you know, this, the Littleton shootings are going to go on and on and on and on. Quite frankly, I don't know when they're going to come off page one. So uh, to answer your question, I think if we, it's, it's a catch-22. And, you know, we're going to have to do our jobs. We've got to, we've got to cover the news. And we've just got to cover it with more taste, I think. I don't think that we need to, uh, fulfill everybody's graphic uh, ideas. I think they can let them use their imagination a little bit. Considering what happened in your community, how did your coverage of the shootings change? How did you do things, do things differently than you did before? Yeah, obviously we did. For one thing, it, uh, it was a week or two weeks after our one year anniversary uh, for our shootings. Uh, so, you know, Jonesboro has now kind of become the model to be compared to every time one of these shootings happens. For whatever reason, uh, you don't see the, the reporters going to Paducah, Kentucky, or Pearl, Mississippi, or Springfield, Oregon. Uh, for whatever reason, they come to Jonesboro. So as soon as this happened, you know, we had the night line airing from Jonesboro. Uh, all the, the memories coming up for the families that uh, we had to cover again. So we've devoted much, much more space uh, than we would have a year ago before these shootings. It would have been a, uh, you know, a one, maybe a one story with a sidebar uh, story uh, that, you know, the day it happened, it was the whole page. And it's still a considerable amount of the page now because the interest in our community uh, is there, our readers demand it, and our community is involved in it. Anybody, you have a question? How did y'all cover the issue of gun control when this occurred? We, uh, we really didn't. Uh, and I, I think we ran maybe one story on it, but uh, to me, that was a, an issue that you couldn't put any hard data on that had anything to do with why these kids killed uh, killed kids. Uh, you know, if we had no guns in our country, you know, zero, then maybe that would have had uh, a bearing. But you know, gun control. Uh, was the issue that the, the national media was focusing on. What about the issue of a 13-year-old having access to guns? That they, that, uh, as long as, there, as guns are legal in the United States and people own them and there's 200 million of them out there, uh, there's going to be access. And while these guns were locked up, you know, the kids were still able to get to them. And, uh, you know, the answer for that I don't have. And I don't think anybody does without uh, just a total, complete ban on guns. And our paper is far from being gun advocates because we're not. Uh, I could care less if they tomorrow banned guns and made everybody turn them in. That would be fine with me too. Or if we're going to have them, that's fine with me too. Uh, I'm, I'm very neutral on the subject. But I thought it was in order for us to start trying to say that handguns and the availability to them are the root of all evil, uh, I don't think that we were qualified or uh, any of the people we'd be talking to are qualified to say that. Uh, there are certainly a lot of people that want to push that, that button and say, yeah, this is the reason, but is it really? Uh, I mean, what's wrong with these children to want them 
whether it's access to a gun or a knife, why would they want to, to do this anyway? Uh, there's something, it's, it's a lot deeper than the availability of handguns. Yeah, uh, they wouldn't have been able to uh, pull off this shooting, but there's still something wrong with these kids. Uh, so we, we, we avoided that because we had too many other things that we could concentrate on uh, that we could prove without getting into the psycho babble. So we tried to stay away from that. Yes? How were the families of the shooters treated both by the newspaper and by the community? We, uh, we interviewed them and gave them their opportunity uh, to say, you know, whatever they needed to say. Uh, we interviewed the grandfather, who's uh, the golden grandfather, who's... Uh, house and guns were the guns that were stolen, uh, whose van was the van that was stolen. Uh, we interviewed the, the other family whose uh, the 11-year-old uh, boy was actually an expert marksman. He had uh, been raised uh, target hunting and uh, as many, many, many uh, kids are in our area, between uh, duck hunting and deer hunting. Uh, hunting is a, a big part of uh, life in, in many areas of the South, North, East, West. I mean, hunting is a, a big deal. Uh, but we gave everybody the opportunity to present their side of the story. Uh, we did not focus on uh, doing stories on the victims' families. Uh, you know, we, we tried to stick with the, with the the shooters uh, and and stay away from the families because once they said what they had to say, you know. Uh, was there anger toward them within the community? They're from a small, small group, but uh, you know the uh, the mother. One of the mothers uh, are the uh, Golden Boy. Uh, or no, Mitchell Johnson. Mitchell Johnson had a little brother. He still attends West Side School and is treated quite fairly and, and normally by the students there and the teachers. Uh, the mother, the, you know, from some of the victims, uh, there's still some anger towards her because she has never officially apologized to the, the families, or personally apologized. She's apologized publicly, but she's never called them up and said, you know, I'm sorry, and, and some of that anger has come out. But, uh, you know, all in all, they are, the families have been treated quite well. The father or the grandfather of uh, uh, the golden boy you know, has been a game and fish officer in, in and around Jonesboro for 35 years and is very well known and liked and respected uh, by people in the community. So, you know, there's actually been quite a bit of sympathy uh, for, for his side of the family. Yes? Fact the media was coming down and portraying the community as a whole, as a, you know, the, the gun community. Do you think that that contributed to the reason uh, the community got tired of the, of the media uh, quickly? I think that's that was the biggest reason, uh, not just by their sheer numbers and presence, but what uh, what people were going home and turning on their TV or, or picking up Time magazine or Newsweek and reading. Uh, they knew was not an accurate portrayal of the community they lived in. And, uh, you know, what, what you've spent years and years and years to build can be torn down in just a matter of days uh, by a feeding frenzy of the me media wanting to portray uh, an, an area a certain way. And there was, was and is a lot of resentment uh, because people don't feel that our community was accurately, accurately portrayed by the media. Um, you mentioned the Montel Williams talk show and stuff. Do you, what's your, what are your views on talk show, that side of the media? I mean, the Jenny Jones trial and everything, I mean, what well, do you think about it? First of all, I hate to call them media, but I guess <laughs> I guess we have to. I mean, they, they, they've been grouped with us. I don't call them media. Uh, but I, I don't think a lot about the the Montel Williams or, or Jenny Jones or. Do you think uh, that she um, guilty of causing that murder? 
No, I, I really don't. I don't think that you can't foresee the future. You can't see what some disturbed individual is going to do or, or somebody who gets uh, put into a, a bad situation or uh, is going to do. Uh, do I think what she did was uh, ethical or right? No, I don't, I, I don't think it was a story. I don't think, uh, I, I just, their entertainment, I don't consider them media, I consider them entertainment, unfortunately. Uh, when people start doing bad things, all of a sudden they become media. Uh, but pure entertainment, Jerry Springer, all of them, sorry. Um, most of the editorials were uh, were focused on healing of the community. Uh, we did not get into trying to analyze the why. Why did this happen? Uh, because that would be guessing, unsubstantiated. We don't know why. You know, we'll never un unless these two children tell us why. We'll never know why. Why they did what they did. Uh, so, you know, most of our editorials were uh, on, on ways to, to heal the community, on bring the community together to, uh, you know, to go forward with this terrible tragedy. And, uh, and, and we're still doing editorials on that. With juveniles, it just doesn't happen. Uh, you know, we would have loved to have interviewed them in jail, but uh, while they they were in jail waiting for their adjudication hearing, technically they're under the uh, supervision of the court, and uh, so you know they're not granting any access. Of course, their attorneys would not let them. Uh, 